Good morning. This is April 1st, year 2003. We're in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates, and our cameraman is Robert Dunbar. We're pleased, pleased to have with us today John Jackson. John, good morning, and good morning. thank you for coming. We appreciate your being here. May I ask when you were born? I was born in Boyd, Wisconsin. And can, would you mind telling us the date? Uh, September 9th, 1924. And what is your current address? Framingham, Massachusetts. And marital status? Uh, my wife has passed away last, this last year. I'm sorry to hear that, John. Do you have children, John? Yes, I have two. When and where did you enter the military? Well, I entered the military and was sworn in in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in October 6, 1942. If I read your papers correctly, even before you went into the military, you were really intent on flying or being a flyer, is that correct? Definitely, yes. Can you tell us something about a Taylor Cub in your lifetime? I sure can. I uh, had an intense interest in flying. So as a youngster, I would get near any airplane I could find. And my first exposure to a Taylor Cub was one of uh, a neighbor, uh, lived about 12 miles from our place, had built a plane of his own, eventually bought a Taylor Cub, and he uh, landed in a field near a baseball game that I was at on a Sunday. That was my first exposure to a factory-made airplane. And then uh, eventually, a few months later, I saved up enough money to, to get a ride with him, and he had changed that plane for another one. He had a, a, a Taylor Craft then, but it was still a small two-place airplane, and that was my first flight. And then I flew in uh, Piper Cubs with another neighbor that used to go on Sundays to ball games, church picnics, anything that had a field near it. And uh, I'd go along with them and then I'd collect money for past passengers that wanted to take a ride. I looked at that as uh, the perfect American dream, John, that you guys would fly around, see a crowd down there land, and then you would get out and sell tickets yeah. for rides. Yeah. And so I guess you made some money so you could ride, uh, get more rides for yourself. Well, he, he was a very kind man. He, uh, I'd see him after church and he'd say, you want to go flying today? Well, I definitely said yes. You know, I'd ride home with him. They lived on a farm uh, north of town of four miles or three miles. and. Uh, about three miles from our house, so it didn't take me long to get home after we came back. So, after when you joined the service in October of 42, um, did you join the Army and then hope to be transferred into flying, or how did that come about? You, you played it pretty well. I went into the Army and uh, specified, uh, when I enlisted, I specifically stated that I was going into the Air Corps, as it was known at the time. And uh, so I was sent to basic training at, uh, at an airfield, Kiesler Field, Mississippi. When you went into the service, John, did you go in um, by yourself, or were there school friends with you, or you were only on your own? Only me, yeah. Okay, and you and you um, were given promises by the recruiting officer or whoever inducted you that eventually this is the path that would wind up to your flying. Is that correct? Well, <clears throat> only if I could pass an exam that could and get by a board that would 
qualify me to be an aviation cadet. So you went down to Mississippi, uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, and at first uh, you were at, at a place called Fort Sheridan, Illinois. Yeah, Fort Sheridan was uh, the military base near Milwaukee, which covered that part of Wisconsin. And that's where I actually got my army uniform, dog tags, and... Uh, this is kind of a processing center yeah, for yeah. people entering the Mississippi. Yeah. What did you do at Biloxi, Mississippi? Then we had basic training, which involved close order drill, uh, hikes, um, did you uh, get rifles? Uh, no, we had. We were exposed kind of to them. We did some uh, target shooting, but did not have a rifle issued to us. It was only for the day, that type of thing. And at what point uh, did the Army keep its promise and start sending you down that path that led to flying? Well, I was transferred then to Chanute Field, Illinois, and I went to Link Trainer Instructor School. And I was part way through that, well, most of the way through it. And uh, I went before, I took a test for aviation cadets, and then went before a board, and they approved me to be a cadet. Let's go back just a second. Uh, Link Trainers, you um, did you have any choice as to what your job would be in the service? Yeah. Were they offering you other things? Yes. Gunneries or uh, well, navigating or something like they that? They were at that time offering a parachute packer, uh, aviation mechanics. You could go to a mechanic school, an aircraft mechanic school, and uh, weather forecasters, weather observers technical things within the air. But none of those would get you up in the air no, necessarily. No. So you stuck with it. You wanted yeah. to, Would you tell us please what a link trainer is? Well, a link trainer is a, is a device that uh, you have a, 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 a thing that looks something like an airplane, but you were sitting up in a cockpit with instruments in it, and there's a cab uh, top over it, a canopy, and then there's a, a soldier at a desk with another device that looks like a big crab, and that will track over certain things that you're scheduled to do, such as work in a range, what they used to call flying the beam, and uh, you had to intersect a beam in a certain way and then follow that beam to the to the uh, cone of silence which was a, a part of an instrument landing then when you determined that you had a certain procedure then you had to follow for a particular airfield to go at a certain heading descend down to 400 feet and there should be a runway ahead of you Hopefully. Yeah. 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 So you were training pilots, really? Yeah. Training other guys to fly when you... That instrument type flying, yeah. Right. Okay. How did you get out of that, or how did you... Well, that, I went directly into cadets from that. That's when you met this board and talked to them? Yes. What did... Is this a like an oral exam? Well, uh, there was a written exam first. And then did they talk to you about being a pilot? Yes. Is this for your uh, psychological attitude toward being a pilot? I think that entered into it. Can yes. you remember why, what struck them about you that they uh, immediately said, yes, you could uh, begin to become a pilot training? Well, I suppose desire played a part in it. You're, and I think I portrayed that by the fact that I uh, <clears throat> followed aviation when I was a child or a young boy really and did what I could to get my body into an airplane even just to have a flight was an immense thrill to me, an absolute thrill. 
lead us through the steps then, John, from uh, the time you became a, a cadet candidate and working your way toward uh, being a pilot in the United States military services. Can you tell us progressively where you went, what you learned, what you studied? Yeah. I uh, was sent from there to Nashville, Tennessee, to a, a, a place where they examined your abilities, coordination. They gave you a psychoanalysis, I guess, and uh, it was determined whether you would be a pilot or a navigator or a bombardier, for instance. At that point, did you have a choice of those three, or did they decide looking at your tests, what, what they needed and wanted? Well, I think you expressed your, your uh, hope, first of all, your ambition, but then provided you passed the test in a certain way, that determined whether you became a pilot or not. In becoming a pilot, where was that fork in the road where you would become a fighter pilot or a bomber pilot? Well, that was later, much later, when you were in advanced flying school. When we get there, let's talk about that. Yeah. What, okay. what went into that decision? So okay. Uh, from this classification center, I then went, was determined I would be a pilot, or trained to be a pilot, and went to Maxwell Field, Montgomery, Alabama, as a pre-flight school. And that involved uh, aircraft recognition, it involved uh, code, sending of code, receiving of code, a Morse code, and uh, and pretty tough on the discipline, and a lot of close order drill, parade, parade ground, marching, that type of thing. In your record, John, as I went over it, I was struck by the fact that it. Uh, at Maxwell Field at Montgomery, you were put into a class, uh, the, the, the class you were to graduate yeah. in the first class of 1944. That was way down the track, but even then, uh, they knew what training you were going to receive over the next better part of a year, Yeah, and you were going to be in the first class of 44 yeah. with others, so you were get, beginning now to pick up people that you would be with for quite a while, maybe even uh, after you got into combat. It, is that true? Well, not, not picking them up yet. For that, uh, from that point, uh, you went on to primary flight training, then basic flight, and then advanced as a cadet. You're still a cadet. Where did you go from uh, Alabama? went from there to Carlstrom Field, Arcadia, Florida. Now that was my primary flight training. That's where I first got in an airplane yeah. and flew. And I uh, flew Stearman's, wiping a biplane, open cockpit, and we actually learned to fly, made your first solo flight, etc., cetera, and uh, prepared you for more flying, I guess. If I understand the system you went through, John, you never knew when your solo was coming up. The, the, no. The, the day would just arrive and the uh, instructor would say to you, well, this is it. Can you tell us about that day in I your sure life can. and what the instructor said to you? I sure can. We always made, we practiced landings at an auxiliary field away from our main field. Though this auxiliary field was that sod, grass, whatever you want to call it. There was no paved runway there. And we would go in and land and turn around, taxi, come back, take off. Sometimes you'd make running takeoffs, land, and then if he signaled a running takeoff, you checked your trim tab, brought the throttle forward, took off again. <clears throat> One day we were doing this, I had about eight hours in the air at the time, and the instructor said, pull over here. And he started climbing out of the airplane. I had a suspicion what was going on. 
He says, there's no sense of you killing the both of us. You go up and kill yourself, will you? But he had he every, was, every he, confidence in you. <laughs> well, that's how he, he had a, apparently enjoyed doing that. He looked ahead to it, and so then it was a matter of taking off, and I made three landing. Take off, go around the pattern, come in and land. I did that three times, then taxied over to the toolbox and uh, picked him up again. He says, congratulations, you're, you sold. <laughs> What was your feeling when you saw him climbing out and you knew what was coming over? Was it uh-oh or at last or? Well, somewhere I, around at last, yeah. yeah. You, were, you were aching to do this. Wasn't yeah, and you'd heard from other guys that it yeah. happened to, you know, and that's the way they all did it. Why don't you go up and kill yourself? Well, yeah. That, that was encouraging. <laughs> Where did you go from there, John? From there I went to basic flight training at Cortland, Alabama. And you would get a heavier plane there, oh, Much heavier, yeah. yeah. The, the, it was a Vault-T manufacturer called a BT-13. BT standing for basic training. And it was... Uh, Big engine, it was a pretty big airplane. It was one that we looked at when we were in primary. They had one of them on our field down there, and boy, you were a god if you could fly one of those things. But when you got to the, got to it, it was just a matter of starting all over again, the whole process. The reaction of the plane would be different from what you'd flown. Oh yeah, there you was, got used to yeah, it would have the, yeah. the, the feeling of a heavy airplane. Where still like the uh, primary flight training, BT, uh, the PT-17, the Stearman, it uh, was just a lighter handling airplane and you could seem to go through the air in a not so solid way. I can't quite come up with the words, but the BT was more solid. And uh, then you started into formation flying, instrument flying, night flying. Was it there, John, that you ran into a storm? There was a storm <clears throat> when I was in basic flight training. I was supposed to fly a night cross country and for some reason or other did not. They didn't have enough airplanes or for some reason I wasn't scheduled then. But a lot of them went up into the, for the schedule cross country. They were given a predetermined point. It was a three-legged cross country. And they flew across the front and uh, ended up that nine people were killed in that. Nine separate accidents, eight separate accidents. One was two people in one plane. And the rest were all individual cadets. It was, uh, it was quite a thing to go through, you know, to, to, to observe. Very serious business you yes. were in. Yeah. yeah. And from there, uh, if something you just said about uh, formation flying, yes, which would become crucial as you went on. It sure and, was. And became that, that, an advanced pilot. Tell us about flying an airplane deliberately up close to other airplanes. Well, <clears throat> that was your first exposure to it. And uh, they start, we started in the air and then eventually landed in formation and took off in formation, but it was the only place we ever did that. But back to your question about uh, uh, flying close to another airplane, you had to get close and you just didn't fly up and sit beside him because somehow you were either going to gain on him or lose, fall back. You could never set it exactly that you'd be exact synchronization with your lead plane. So you were taught to slowly move the throttle to do what you wanted to do, which was either gain speed or hold it back a little because if you were running up on him too much, 
you better bring it back a little or you're going to be in trouble. Isn't flying in formation um, breaking all your basic instincts when you're up in a plane that you're taught to stay away from other planes and yeah. planes do this, <laughs> yeah. but now you're being taught to do just the opposite. Yeah. And you'd done a lot of flying before you got up there. What, what did you feel about this? Well, you, you had to be on your toes. You had to really do it. And uh, you knew that it was important in your future flying, so you did your best at it that you could. Was, you d didn't look around much at the scenery then, Not did you? whatsoever. You're, look you're looking you at some guy's at the lead tip. airplane. Yeah. Where did you go from there, John? From there I went to Freeman Field, Seymour, Indiana for advanced flight training. And <clears throat> that's where I flew AT-10, that was the twin engine advanced trainer. These are twin engines, planes. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about flying in an enclosed cockpit, John. Well, an enclosed cockpit uh, was different from an open cockpit because you didn't have all the air. In an open cockpit you had air all around you and you wore goggles so the wind wouldn't affect your eyes and uh, for purposes of instrument flying did they pull pull all the shades down as it were in, the, in these planes? Well, it, for the instrument part of it, they had a... Uh, was this in the twin engine airplane? Yes. Yes. They had a, a, a shade that they put on the inside of the, uh, the cockpit windshield. And that was color green. And then you wore goggles that were red and that one nullified the other and you couldn't look beyond the the uh, plastic that they'd put on, on the uh, interior of the windshield so you had to had to go by the instruments and uh, then it was the big instruments that you watched was your needle ball and airspeed your airspeed indicated whether you were flying level it should fly at a certain exact as long as your altimeter wasn't going up or down, you were level. And uh, then to, for your air, for your turning, you had a needle, ball, a needle and ball. That was a, a gyroscopically controlled instrument. And if the needle swung over one needle width, you were making a standard rate turn. And then your ball was like in a glass groove with dampening fluid in it and that was what showed whether you were skidding or slipping or making a coordinated turn and it was uh, and that was really the heart of the instrument flying and then you went on to radio ranges and climbing and and descending and uh, well, that's about it. At the end of this um, training in a two-engine plane now, were you given your wings? Was this... At, at the end of this, yes. Now this was the point where it was determined whether you were going to be a fighter pilot or a multi-engine pilot. And <clears throat> that was determined that they did it for you because if you were assigned to go to a B-17 field like I was, you were told to report to such and such an airfield. If it was a fighter, somebody had been determined he'd be a good fighter pilot, he was sent to another type of training. And uh, well, in fact, he went, to, uh, he went to single engine advanced training anyway, but at, at this other, you were to, uh, went to C-47s for instance, you would go to troop carrier type of operation. And so about it. when you got your orders as to where you were going to report, you knew what kind of plane you were going to exactly. fly. Exactly. Uh, do you know by what criteria those decisions were made? No. You're a big guy physically. 
Did they look at you and say he won't fit into a P-51? It could be, yeah. I could be borderline. It's a smaller guy, I was more apt to get into a fighter. What about, what other criteria would there be? Your, um, the swiftness to which you react to something, or uh, your steadiness in flying in formation? Some guy sat in a room and decide, made a decision about you yeah. and others. Well, I think it was determined on how you were graded on, because your every day's instruction that you received was graded by your instructor. And if you were very proficient in some things, I think it had a bearing on where you late, went later. We haven't used the term washout, John. Um, you made it through, you got your wings. What about the guys who, the uh, they didn't make it, they, they didn't get through flight school? Well, what happened to them? Number one, you felt terribly sorry for them because you knew how you would feel if that happened to yourself. Then, some of them were sent or elected to go to navigator training school or bombardier, and others elected to go into gunnery. And uh, but it's all still in airplanes. Yeah, but I think think there's only so much room for in the pipeline for these people, and some of them I think went into the infantry or into other branches of the service. But one morning you were out on the hard stand and you got your wings. Tell us about that ceremony, John. Well, that was in a hangar and we had our uniforms, officers' uniforms, with no, we had the insignia up in the lapel, no bars yet, no wings yet, and uh, in the hangar, the colonel, more or less, was the master of ceremony, the base commander, and he, he pinned the wings and bars on one or two graduates. The rest of us, we pinned them on each other. You're one of your friends, you're alphabetically was beside you and you pinned his wings on and bars and he did the same to you. And uh, then they gave a speech and we were newly commissioned second lieutenants ready to take on the war. You were an officer and at the same time they made you a gentleman, isn't well, that right? Well, <laughs> that varied in occasion. <laughs> but I can recall that uh, one of the things that happened, the first salute that you got, you gave, you were supposed to give whoever did it, saluted you a dollar bill. Well, we were told by our leaders that if when you left that hangar, there was going to be a bunch of soldiers out there ready to highball you. Right. So. You put your head down, if you didn't see him, you couldn't return a salute. So I did that. I went down through and then I walked on and pretty soon here comes a whack. And she salutes. And so then I said, just a minute, lady or young lady, whatever. And I said, that was my first salute and here's a $5 bill. So she was surprised because she wasn't expecting it. And uh, that I could just, lead to a great misunderstanding yeah. <laughs> on her part. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it, so you got your first salute. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that was at uh, you were in Seymour, Indiana. Yes. Uh, was was your family able to come down to the ceremonies? No. no. That's too bad. Yeah. That they missed that. Yeah. I I got uh, here that this was in February of '44. Now you are a fully commissioned pilot. It was April. April. Yeah. Sorry, I got because I had uh, I got sick in pre-flight. I was in the hospital with scarlet fever, and then a couple of times they uh, 
I was sent back because of uh, ground school got plugged up and they couldn't process as many as they should and uh, so I went from 44A to 44D, D being graduating in April, April 15th. The, the fourth month of the year. Okay. Yeah. April 15th, 44. Yeah. Where did you go from there? This, you're in the big time now and you yeah. got your orders to go to some place and so you knew you were going to be a bomber pilot, yes. is that correct? Yeah. Lockburn Army Air Base in Columbus, Ohio, where I was assigned. How did you get to the base? Did you fly into it? Well, I went home on leave first. They gave us the leave and then you went in by train. I went to Wisconsin, was home for 30 days, and then went down to Lockburn and uh, checked in there. Had you seen in your time in the Air Force B-17s up to that time? No. So you're arriving at this base and there's these mammoth, huge, yeah. four-engine planes sitting out there. Can you tell us how you felt about that? Well, first of all, you marveled at the size of it. You wondered how you'd ever fly something that big, but then you'd look up and see them flying around so you knew they could fly. And uh, just to give you an idea, the wingspan was a hundred and five feet, I think, on that. That's pretty, almost twice as long as my house is. So. And the tail is about 20 feet high oh, up off the very ground. very high, yeah. They're a big plane. This yeah. is a four-engine plane. At the time, they sure were. And how old were you, John? Well, you I were was born pretty young, weren't you? I was, yeah, I was born in 1924, and so September of '44, I was 20 years old. So prior, I was 19 when I went to to fly B-17. Tell us about learning how to fly a B-17. Well, <clears throat> the instructor was assigned four students. So there were four of us newly uh, commissioned pilots in the airplane and he would put the uh, one in the left seat, he stayed in the right and the other two could do what they wanted. They could go sit in any part of the airplane or take a nap or whatever. But the, he taught you how, how to taxi, how to handle the throttles. And uh, <clears throat> after taxiing, lining up on the runway and advancing, getting clearance from the tower by radio to take off, and then advancing your throttles and taking off. And uh, I was always taught, I was taught at that time not to push your stick forward <clears throat> and to lift your tail up, just let it come up naturally as you gain speed. You were better to, easier, better to take off in a, in a semi-tail low attitude than to bring some guys to tip them up so high you'd almost think the props were going to hit the, the runway. What was the takeoff speed? Oh, golly. Uh, seems to me we lifted off the ground at about 80 indicated airspeed. I'm just guessing, it's been so long. How do you get used to, you know, you, you drive cars or you fly smaller planes, how do you get used to the fact that you've got wings sticking out like 60 feet from where you're sitting in, in either direction, so that you don't hit stuff when you're taxiing around? Well, <laughs> or you know you? that that's the end of your flying career, you start bumping into anything, but you have to watch, you really have to watch and look around and of course you didn't have to do an S turn in that plane like you did in, in your cadet days because in the cadet days there was always the nose of an airplane ahead of you so if you were going to see where you were going you'd be make a turn to the left and look this way turn to the right and look that way just so you didn't run into somebody or something but you were high enough up in this airplane and you looked directly ahead and you didn't you just had you had to watch your wingtips, though. Believe me, you you got in close quarters. You somebody out there. Yeah, yeah. 
I asked you a moment ago, John, how you felt uh, the first time you lifted off all by yourself in a solo. What's it like to take off a B-17 for the first time? Well, it's quite a thrill. It's an accomplishment. And, uh, and more or less, you couldn't solo like you did back in the cadets because you had to have a co-pilot. So when the instructor felt you were ready, he just scheduled you to sit in the left seat. The other guy was in the right seat. He was your co-pilot. And then chances are, after you went and shot a few landings, you were instructed to switch seats. And then the other guy was making his first solo takeoff, so to speak. Even though you weren't solo, you were, had to have a co-pilot. Is this a hard plane to fly? John, is it physically demanding on you to get that thing into the air and steer it around? And well, it, it, it can be. If you, if you use your trim tabs uh, adroitly, it, would, it wasn't too much trouble. In other words, as you were at, at, at an altitude you wanted to climb, all you had to do was roll a little trim in and you could trim it to, to climb. And you could also trim your uh, rudder trim, and you had aileron trim. So there's a lot of mechanical things on the plane yeah, working for you. Yeah, little things, yeah, to I assist you. We've had people here who uh, flew B-24s, and they still to this day say there was a, a great deal of physical effort to do that. I flew B-24s later. And how, how do you compare the two planes? Well, exactly as you stated, the, the, the B-17 went through the air better, easier, and it was very forgiving, where a B-24 was almost like flying a boxcar. You, uh, <clears throat> you uh, couldn't make sharp turns, there were more of a wally, a wally, I can't think of the word. Uh, they were less responsive, yeah, I gather. Yeah, and uh, then of course the B-24 was a tricycle landing gear. That was my first experience when I, this was after I'd been in combat and come back and then I checked out the B-24. It was my first experience in a tricycle landing gear. That Your landings are slightly different in those as against a, B, as a tail dragger, they call it a B-17. In any event, you want to land with your main wheels first. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, not I the nose it. wheel. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got my notes here from your history. Um, are you, you're picking up a crew now? Uh, you, you go to Tampa, Florida, is that correct? Yeah. And you, you get your crew. You, you, do you have a co-pilot when you uh, go through the experiences we just described at Columbus? No. So the crew is all brand new. Yes, right. Can you talk about the time you first met the people you felt you were going to go into combat with? Well, yeah. You had received your orders, and, uh, and they in turn received the same orders listed the pilot, the co-pilot, the engineer, the bombardier, the navigator, radio man, wall turret, and waist gunner and tail gunner. And uh, that was the first time you saw or knew who any of them would be, including your co-pilot. Did, did you just say that you have a list of names before you meet them? On it, your orders? Yeah, you do. Okay. So you you know their names and then there's suddenly faces and personalities. Yeah. yeah. And you all talk about uh, what do you talk about when you get together the first time? Well, I guess as I recall it, introduce yourself to everybody and um, <clears throat> Sort of try to analyze them as best you can to see who's a wise guy and who isn't, and who's going to give you trouble and who isn't. And 
how you think they'll do their job, but you're just making snap decisions. You don't really come across this until you actually fly with them. You were 20 years old at the time? Yeah. You know? Any comments about that? Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't fly across the Sudbury River with a 20-year-old pilot today. <laughs> Did anybody have any comments about your age? No. No, there were some I don't know if there was anybody younger than me or older, but a lot of them were somewhat older. My engineer was the old man of the crew, and he was 22 at the time. And How about the gunners? Weren't they generally younger yeah, guys? Yeah, and these, uh, the gunners were 19, 20, 21, long in there. In Florida, with your crew, um, you began to realize that you're getting close to going overseas, I would assume, or, yeah. or hoped to, that you were going to do that. At Avon Park, is that correct? Yeah, Florida. Avon Park, Florida. You went to Hunter Field and then up to Savannah. And at, where was it Savannah that you got your plane and all your equipment? Yeah, yeah. So you. You go up there and you see a plane sitting out on the field and this one's going to be yours. They assign your number. You've got a number. And then you and the crew have our, uh, fly that particular airplane for a few days before you leave. And you do things like swing your compass. That's where you had a big compass rose painted on concrete out on the, a runway somewhere. And you parked it so that it was exactly north and then you had to adjust your compass so it showed north because and it had to be on a number of headings that you did this to keep get your compass swung they call it swinging the compass and you learned the procedures of of flying on oxygen that was a very important because if, if that wasn't done correctly people could die and uh, at a later time, I had a ball gunner that almost did die from lack of oxygen, but due to a system that we had on the, on the plane, or we had been told to use, we managed to save him. When you're checking out a new plane like this, <clears throat> kind of a shakedown, do you check the bomb shackles? Do you check uh, the intervalometer or whatever it is and uh, I see that everything is working properly? The bombardier would be checking that. The pilot would, didn't get into those into that end. Of, I didn't anyway into that end of it much. But as a group, you're looking at this new piece of machinery to yes. see that everything works. Yeah. Did anything not work in the plane? Was not that it, I recall. It was fine. Yeah. And you got all your flight suits and combat uniforms, and yeah. uh, you're about ready to go, aren't We're you? We're ready to go. Tell us about getting your orders to leave the United States. Well, we got the orders. <clears throat> we were briefed also that we were to fly to Manchester, New Hampshire, check in with radio to the Manchester control there. But we were given a route that we had to fly, and uh, we had to uh, not fly over Washington, D.C., as you were over the White House and things like that, and if you did things, you, you were liable to get forced down or reported, or somehow something bad was going to happen to you. And then you didn't, they kept you away from Philadelphia, kept you away from New York City, and put us to uh, Stewart Field, which is just outside West Point, New York. And then we made a uh, turn there towards Manchester, New Hampshire, with eventually Boston being off to your right. I never knew I would be living in the area someday, but contacted with radio, contacted <coughs> Manchester, <coughs> And they said we were to go ahead on up to Bangor, Maine, because they split half the planes into Manchester and half into Bangor, Maine. And so we went into Bangor, and uh, then 
eventually left from there to go overseas and the overseas was the northern route it was scheduled to be the northern route you took the airplane over to Great Britain and this is in December of 44 that's in December that of 44 <clears throat> What was your route overseas, up to Goose Bay and... Uh, yeah, we went from Bangor to Goose Bay and landed. But we had a, uh, we hit bad weather. There was bad weather at Goose, and we had to land in Mingan, Quebec, M-I-N-G-I-N. It's on the St. Lawrence River in, on Quebec. It was a field that could accommodate the B-17. And uh, a number of us had to go in there until the weather was clear. Then we flew on into Goose Bay, Labrador. And uh, <clears throat> I'll never forget, first landed at Goose Bay, it was just getting dark. And up that far, far north in December, it gets dark pretty early. And I had a navigator that was from Texas, and he always stated that you Yankees don't know what real cold is. He says we get a wet cold down in Texas, and you get a dry cold, and that's easier to to handle. Well, we got to Goose Bay, Labrador, and it was I think 25 below, and the wind was blowing. And he then finally conceded that it d did get cold up in the north much colder than he had experienced in Texas. <laughs> so it was all worthwhile, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> and then at, at Goose Bay, we didn't even get bed to sleep in. They had the barracks were full because there was a plug of us planes that come in from Mingan that had landed there because of the weather. So we slept in the hallways in the headquarters building and you're heading on your parachute bag and no blankets over you, or under you, or anything. You just grab some sleep and then they woke you up and they briefed you. And then they were scheduled that we would go from there to Iceland, Reykjavik, Iceland. But we had to hit the tip of Greenland, the southern tip of Greenland. There was a radio range there for a navigation point and then turned and headed in an easterly direction towards Iceland. And uh, that flight was 11 hours, to give you an idea of what a prolonged flight that was. You're a new pilot, and yeah. your crew is looking at you. How's yeah. this guy doing? Yeah. How's he flying? Were you looking at your navigator and wondering how good he is? Well, I'll tell you a good story right on that, right along this part of the trip. I asked him what our ETA was for Iceland, and he estimated time of had, arrival. Estimated time of arrival, and I told him that it would. He told me that it would be three seventeen, shall we say? Well, comes ten minutes past three. I'm looking and flying along, and it's all ocean. There's no Iceland up ahead. On the interphone, come up here. I want to talk to you. Would you recheck your figures? You're, something's wrong. You didn't have your winds correctly calculated or somehow. And he went back and then he called me on the intercom and said, I was an hour off on the estimated time of arrival. I made a, uh, a mathematical mistake. It should be 417. Well, in a half an hour, there's Iceland up ahead of us and we landed there then. That would have made a big difference if you were low on gas. Oh, you're, you were getting low because it's 11 hours in the air, you are low. And you don't, go, you don't have anywhere else to go except your, where you're scheduled to go. Did you have a nice little chat with the navigator? Oh, and, yeah, I had to talk with him because he was kind of a cocky guy and he, uh, he had to be talked to once in a while. From Reykjavik, where did you go to? Hmm? From Reykjavik. Oh, then, where did you go then after it that? was the British Isles. It was we first flew into as a navigation point Prestwick. That was a range, and I believe on an island in northern Scotland. 
and then we were to fly to a point in Ireland, Nuts Corner it was called. Nuts I still corner. don't think it's, yeah, Nuts and New TTS Corner. And I don't think there's a town named that up there. I think it was just a, a, a description of a radio, a point that we were had to, to, to hit that and then fly to Valley Wales, which was a left turn to get back across the water and land in, at Wales. It's that, a kind of convoluted course. Why is that, John? Because if you deviated from that, you weren't briefed the way you should come in, you could get shot down. That was the way you were to come in. Anybody coming in any other direction was consumed to be a German trying to sneak in or something. You're in Europe. Um, can you tell us the date of arrival um, in Europe? <coughs> All I can say it was um, the very end of December, because I spent Christmas in Valley Wales. That was where we went in, and uh, then. So I would say that we got to our group right at the very last week in December. Of 44. Yeah. So you were arriving just at the time of the Battle of Bulge was going on over in the... Uh, yeah, it was, except that I didn't realize it was going on. Because <laughs> we didn't follow the news very close when we were coming across the ocean. Now you're going to join up with a squadron, a group, and all of that. Uh, can you tell us what groups and organizations you were in for the purposes of this tape, John? Yes, I was assigned to the 388th Bomb Group at Nettishaw, England, and that was in East Anglia, about halfway between Cambridge and Norwich as a geographical point. And uh, we were transported by truck to that point. Then they were assigned to a barracks, assigned to a squadron. I went to the 563rd squadron. And they took over. You enlisted in October 42. Yeah. And it's now uh, January of 45. And you've been training all this time and flying and, and honing your skills. Yeah. Um, tell us about your first combat mission. Well, the first combat mission uh, was somewhat memorable because it is your first mission. The first thing that I recall that uh, you're told what airplane you're going to fly and that truck took you out to the hard stand where the airplane was. Then the airplane that I flew had a name. It was called Gremlin's Hideout. And they had painted a picture on the nose of an outdoor toilet and a gremlin sticking his head out through the crescent or some opening in the top of the toilet. Just to be funny, I guess. And. Uh, when we went to fly, I can recall that somebody had left the side window open instead of closed. And it snowed that night. And a lot of snow had blown in onto the pedestal where the controls were, part of the control switches and things like that. And we spent quite a while dusting and sweeping all that out of there, but then was somewhat worried that there might be a malfunction in a switch due to the dampness, but it never occurred. And we went up to, um, I forget, I've got a list here where it is anyway, but on this mission, I expected all hell to break loose because you always read about the, the toughest missions that happened. Well, we went over and dropped our bombs and came back and we had run into anti-aircraft fire, the flak, and got on the ground and the crew chief 
Excuse came me, out John. and walked at the airplane with us. Excuse me, but um, this is that's my your mission. flight schedule. Yeah, that you were kind enough to share with us. Yeah, my first mission was January twenty eighth, nineteen forty five, to Hoden Budberg, Germany. Oh, thank you. And I don't recall what the uh, what target it could have been marshalling yards. I don't think it was a manufacturing plant, but I do think it was, we bombed pretty heavy marshalling yards to just destroy their capability of transportation and train transportation and keeping the... You were telling us about flak, that uh, you got, yeah, got and quite a bit of flak here. So we were looking at the airplane and we started counting holes in the tail area. And we had 28 holes. And so then we were debriefed, and the debriefing officer said, uh, what kind of flak did you encounter today? I said, well, I'd say meager to light and somewhat accurate. It didn't shoot us down. And uh, so then, he said, did you see any holes in the plane when you came back? I said, yeah, we counted them. There were 28. And he looked at the report and he said, uh, Lieutenant Jackson, I think you should change that to somewhat heavy and very accurate. He said, this has got 28 holes. Because <laughs> so, I had no idea what to base it on, you know? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You thought that was just standard flat. Yeah. Something I read about you last night, John, was that you went to your commanding officer and asked them to give you as many flights as possible. Yes, we did. Was that, would, was, were other people as gung-ho as that? Well, the crew was. I mean, we, we had a crew meeting first, and I brought the subject up, said, let's get this thing over with and get home as fast as we can, not knowing that the war was approaching its termination. So, lo and behold, they scheduled us every darn mission they could. And, uh, and just to give you an idea, I think we flew our 35 missions in 82 days. And that included a, a three-day pass and, or, and it included a bailout in, on the continent. We were a few days not in, in, uh, <clears throat> in the pipeline then. So 35 missions and you can go home. Yeah. So you guys wanted to do it all in one day. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> if we could. <laughs> was if that they'd a let little, us. They, I don't know what their trade-offs on a thing like that, whether you would prefer to have time in between flights or you want to just get it over with. What was your frame of mind? My frame of Let's mind home, was right? want to get it over with. And... Uh, which is a dumb decision, really, because had we not done that, we wouldn't have had to fly 35 missions to expose yourself that long. Because the war ended. Ended, the war ended. That was a dirty trick, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> it went you, over all right. You just used a, a term that uh, most pilots would rather not use, bailout over France. Oh, yeah. Tell us what happened there. Well, this was in April. I think it was April 15th. I've got it written down here in a way. But we were, uh, <clears throat> had to gather formation over Europe. There were a few times we couldn't gather formation over England, so we'd fly to a certain radio station marker and meet your rest of your group there and form into formation and go on in and bomb Germany. Well, we were headed all by ourselves alone to that marker, that radio marker, and number two engine, lo and behold, number two engine's on fire. It's coming out by the call flaps. And I took and quickly analyzed the nomenclature of where the engine hooks onto the wing, where the gas tanks were, and determined that we probably had blown a hole 
back into the gas tank. We were going to get an explosion very soon. So I immediately ordered the crew to bail out. But I threw the emergency bomb release, which was uh, on a control panel down by my left leg. And that opened the bomb bay door, dropped the bomb, all in the split second, I guess. And then the order to bail out and everybody went out. And then I went through the plane. I put it on autopilot and went through the plane, make sure everybody was out. Went from the nose back through the middle of the plane out to where the tail gunner was, came back, went out through the bomb bay. And uh, it was about 11,000 feet when I bailed out. And the first time I pulled the ripcord, nothing happened. I thought, oh my God, this is it. Yeah, this is gonna be a bad day. And uh, so then I pulled it again harder and it worked. Is this a chest chute you're wearing? A backpack. Backpack. The rest of the crew <clears throat> wore chest packs. The co-pilot had a backpack like mine because in your seat, it was better to have it there and when, the, when you came out of that seat and bailed out, you didn't want to start running around looking for your parachute. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I floated down to earth and it was a, a very definite silence. You didn't hear a single solitary thing except the pilot chute, which pulls your main chute out, was sitting up there ruffling and it almost sounded like a bride walking down the church aisle in her gown, you know, kind of a, just a ruffle, a rustle, like. And uh, and I observed about 20 seconds after I bailed out, the airplane blew up, the wing blew, and it went down, and down. And uh, so then I landed on the ground, and uh, my chute landed in a tree, a small popple tree, and. Uh, I had no sooner got up and I was just unhooking my parachute harness and so forth and here comes a French farmer with a pitchfork. And he's, I can't speak one word of French, he can't speak one word of English, but he is saying, La Boche, La Boche, well I remembered that Boche in French meant German. So I got across that I was not La Boche, I was an American and I, he finally got it across, so then he took me to a little village that they had right nearby where they all lived and took me to his, into his house and they, I had gotten a uh, bang on my head and I was bleeding a little. And uh, so his wife, uh, well they were afraid, I had a 45 on me on a side holster, most of the guys put him in a shoulder holster, but I preferred it on the side. I thought it looked more like Tom Mix, I suppose, but... Uh, Tom Mix? <laughs> I, uh, uh, I had to take that off and I tossed it in the, on the corner. And then the wife was a little more happy about this thing and she put some rubbing alcohol on my head. And then they gave me a, a drink. They wanted to know if I wanted to drink uh, or take anything they'd give me. So they gave me a clear liquid, and he took one, and he started sipping on it a little while I took it and I tossed it down. Well, when it hit bottom, my hair stood up on end and sparks came out of my ears. I just, it was a terrible jolt. <laughs> so later uh, I asked a, 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 an American Provost Marshal at a police uh, at a place we the farmer took me to. What way I had to drink back there, so he talked in French to the farmer, and then he says he laughed. He said you had Calvados, and I said well what the heck is Calvados? He said it's a distilled apple brandy, noted for being like fire water. So I. Didn't have any more. Welcome to France. Yeah. A question um, I'd like to ask you. When you take off and going in a combat mission, 
there comes a point where you tell the gunners to clear their guns. Mm -hmm. Do you do that at any particular place, or just that it's the t time of the flight, or do you hope they hit something on the ground, or um, <clears throat> what's the protocol there? I think we were told from our squadron commander, the lead plane, the group commander, to clear guns, as I recall it. I wouldn't bet money on it, but that's the way I recall it. And then so they were supposed to aim a, into the distance, not at the airplane beside them, and just a quick burst to see if it was firing or not. That was all. Okay. You have gotten us up to April. By the way, you bailed out, if I figured correctly, within three weeks of the end of the war. So yeah. did you fly after that again? Yeah. And you got your 35 Got my 35 in. missions. Uh, April 21st. That was, was a week week after uh, you bailed out. Bailed out, yeah. yeah. Ingolstadt, Germany. Then when I got back, uh, nobody announced and said, well, this is your last mission or this is the last mission of the war. Nobody knew that, but they just didn't, weren't any more scheduled. So then I went down to squadron headquarters and told them, well, I've got my 35 missions in. They said, no, you don't. Their card only shows 31. They had all these stamped down the way. And then I had kept a record. So I brought that, went to the barracks and got it and brought it back, went over it with them. And there were four uh, days that they hadn't credited me with, or credited us with, I should say. So they added them to them and they, said, yes, you have accomplished 35 missions, for which we were very glad. So did you go home? Then we went, started the process of going back to the States. How did you get back to the States, John? Well, first of all, they had a interview with you. Do you want to fly a war-weary airplane back? That means one that was too beat up and too far, far used to keep in the war anymore, keep in, do you want to fly one back? My first answer and only answer was no, thank you. And I went back by- That's not a good offer, is it? No, <laughs> not at all. And, uh, and then went back by ship. It was a large ocean liner called the Ile de France. It had really? Belonged, it had belonged to France it was in the class of the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth, but not quite as big. But it was one of the luxury liners in service prior to the war between Europe and the United States. So we came back across the ocean, I forget, five, six days, something like that. To where? To uh, New York Harbor. That must have been exciting to Yes, me. it was. And then we... Uh, wanted to go, hoped we'd go real close to the Statue of Liberty, but we weren't, it didn't happen. They pulled up and we got off the ship and went to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. Was your time up now? Had you signed up for uh, till the end of the war and then I got home? Or had you signed up for four years or six years? No, it was a duration plus, I Duration think. plus. And uh, the war's over now, except for the except, Pacific. Except for Japan. Yeah. Well, I wanted to go and fly B-29. And eventually down the line, you know, after my leave at home and so forth, uh, and rest and recuperation, I volunteered B-29 to Japan. And uh, the personnel officer said, looked at my record and he says, you've done your share. There's no need of you going and, and sticking your neck out again. Well, probably he was right, but it, I was gung-ho at the time and that's the way it was. And you're, I, all, you're all of about 21 years old now, aren't you? I'm, t uh, t yeah, 20, I, I was uh, 21 on September of 45, yeah. 
So the war was truly over? In August, yeah. yeah. What did you do then, John? Then I went into the Air Transport Command, became a ferry pilot, and you ferried different airplanes around as the Air Corps wanted them. And I flew B-24s to California, I flew B-24s to Kingman, Arizona, I flew B-17s, I flew C-47s, you started getting checked out in many, many different airplanes. And you had to get a check out, you had to go to a class, a school, but it didn't take long because an experienced pilot can do that much easier than an inexperienced pilot. I've got a, a note here <clears throat> that you took off one day from, um, I guess, Great Falls, Montana, or, yeah, I think so, and decided to go back to the farm in Wisconsin, and you're in a B-24, and across the street here, if you look out this window now, is a church with a big steeple on it that was buzzed by a B-17 pilot one morning who has sat in your chair there. And I understand you took this B-24 out to your farm? Yeah, I did. Uh, <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, we were be I was being checked out in the B-24 at the St. Paul, Minnesota airport. So it was within 100 miles of my home. So I took a B-24 one day and, well, I'm going to do a little flying. So I hit a red straight for the fire, and pretty soon, way up ahead, I could see the barn roof through the trees, and then the house, knew I was home, and I started in a long, long high-speed glide, or dive, I guess you'd call it. And <clears throat> as I came over the, the barn, two of my brothers, younger brothers, were loading manure into the manure spreader from a manure pile that we had outside our barn. Well, when they saw me come over, they knew immediately who it was. The horses didn't like it. They had horses on the manure spreader. And, uh, and I took one pass and took off. I didn't want to do any circling because I just didn't want to get my number taken. But then I headed for the, for the town of Boyd, which was four miles from our home and took a nice little swing around there. And they still talk about it, some of the people today. And, uh, and then I headed back for St. Paul. I never did get caught. <laughs> Nobody got your number. Nobody right? got the number. <laughs> yeah. With what rank were you discharged, John? For, well, I was discharged in 48. As, uh, I served as the first lieutenant, the highest rank I ever obtained while I was in the service. But I re got a reserve captaincy then when I got out of the service. You went into the reserves as a captain, and you were shown as discharged as a captain on your discharge. But uh, if you hadn't served as one, it didn't make much difference. Looking back on, on not just this very pleasant time we've had today, but looking back over the years, is there one incident that stands out in your mind that you remember more than anything else? I'd have to say it was the bailout. And another, one other thing, uh, uh, one mission particularly stands out. February 3rd, 1945, we bombed Berlin. There were 1,200 of us bombers went in to bomb Berlin. And going in, where we were in the bomber stream, there was a stream coming off of Berlin to our left, headed back for England. They'd already dropped their bomb. And then we went in, dropped our bombs, turned, headed for England. There was an equally long stream of bombers still coming in. They got hit terribly hard that day, terribly hard. And uh, there were, this thing bothers me some because we killed around the reports of 30,000 approximately civilians were killed in that raid. And that, it's 
spin on my conscience, but there was nothing I could do about it. But just stop and, you know, I got to know German people after the war that were back here in the States. One girl was deaf because she as a child. She had suffered eardrum damage from the bombs and so forth, and those things starts making you think. And I guess it just, the end conclusion is that war is a terrible thing. John, is there anything I haven't asked you today that you would like to put um, on the record here for the historians or for your family? Some one last thought that you'd like to add to this tape? Well, no, I consider myself uh, extremely lucky to have gone through the experience of the combat, even though it was frightening at times, and then <clears throat> getting married and having a family, to be able to have that privilege. Because your family's everything when it comes right down to it. And, uh, and I have a wonderful family. John, thank you for coming in today. Thank you. John Jackson, thank you. Thank you.